You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's February 4th. In their confrontation with Russia, the U.S. and its allies are defending what RAND's James Dobbins calls a, quote, dangerously anachronistic principle. The idea that all of Russia's European neighbors should be free to seek NATO membership, and that NATO should be free to incorporate them. This approach is likely to produce further conflicts of the sort already experienced by Georgia and Ukraine, Dobbin says. Quote, the dangers generated by NATO's open-door policy are directed, in the first instance, at those who take the United States and its allies at their word. Consider that, in 2008, NATO leaders prompted by President George W. Bush promised Georgia and Ukraine that they would one day become NATO members. It's now 13 years later, and Russia has invaded both countries and seized their territory either for itself or for Russian proxy regimes, leaving Ukraine and Georgia further from NATO membership than ever. However, Dobbins also notes that abandoning this policy now could be even more dangerous than the potential risks of keeping it in place. So, what's the solution? One could imagine an internationally bolstered status of neutrality for Russia's neighbors that do not wish to align with Moscow and have little prospect of securing American-backed NATO security guarantees, he says. This would be similar to the peaceful and prosperous niche that Finland, Sweden, and Austria carved out for themselves during the Cold War. But achieving such an arrangement among Russia's neighbors would require patient diplomacy and extended efforts to build trust, Dobbins says. This is unlikely while today's crisis persists. Taking a step back from the current situation with Russia, A new RAND paper examines what we've learned over the years about ongoing strategic competition between Washington and Moscow. The author, Stephanie Pazard, has synthesized nearly 60 of our recent reports on this subject. Pazard identifies nine major findings. Number one, U.S.-Russia strategic competition is likely here to stay. Number two, States that are in between Russia and NATO member states, including Ukraine and Georgia, are at the center of this competition. Three, although conventional war with Russia is unlikely, the U.S. should still prepare for it. Four, Russia's hostile actions below the threshold of war are expected to continue. Five, Russia's achievements in its competition with the U.S. are limited so far. Six, The U.S. currently has the lead in this competition, but this advantage could diminish if the wrong policies are implemented. 7. Engagement with Russia remains possible and desirable. 8. The U.S. can help its allies and partners address gray zone threats from Russia. And finally, number 9. These same allies and partners play key roles in helping the U.S. ultimately prevail. These findings suggest several areas for further research, such as vulnerabilities among non-NATO countries near Russia, deterrence dynamics, and the fault lines between U.S. adversaries, especially those between Russia and China. Pazard says that focusing on these understudied questions could lead to new and improved ways for the U.S. to reassure its allies, limit Russia's ability to do harm, and maintain the U.S. advantage in strategic competition. In recent years, insurance companies and other payers have made efforts to pay physicians based on the quality and value of care they provide. But a new RAND study shows that most physicians who work in group practices owned by health systems are paid primarily based on the volume of care provided. In fact, volume-based compensation was the most common type of base pay for more than 80% of primary care physicians and for more than 90% of physician specialists. Additionally, interviews with physicians revealed that increasing the volume of healthcare services delivered was the most commonly reported way to increase compensation. 
According to the study's lead author, Rachel Reed, this data shows that the payment systems most often in place are designed to maximize health system revenue by incentivizing providers to deliver more services. She said, quote, For the U.S. healthcare system to truly realize the potential of value based payment reform and deliver better value for patients, health systems and provider organizations will likely need to evolve the way that frontline physicians are paid to better align with value. By mid century, there could be hundreds of millions of people, even as many as one billion people, displaced by climate change. Despite this large and growing population of climate migrants, there is no agreed upon definition of what makes someone a climate migrant. According to Jay Bologna, a PhD student at the Party Rand Graduate School, and Rand researchers Aaron Clark Ginsburg and Vanessa Parks, fixing this oversight is a necessary first step to creating policies that can help address the problem. Currently, policies that support displaced people. Focus mostly on refugees, people fleeing war, violence, persecution, and other forms of conflict, not those affected by climate change. But some low and middle income countries are leading the way in developing these types of policies and can serve as examples. The government of Bangladesh, for instance, articulated a clear resettlement plan years ago, including a goal to facilitate skills trainings for climate affected households. This could help them meet the needs of the labor market in that country and abroad. The U.S. could build on and learn from these efforts while incorporating them into existing, larger, coordinated systems, improving how agencies like FEMA respond to disasters, but also providing social safety net policies and even programs like Federal Housing Administration mortgage supports. But before such policies can be established, There must be a common understanding of who counts as a climate migrant. Given its experience over the last two years, the U.S. military is fairly well postured for a deployment during a pandemic. But imagine a hypothetical war with China, while a deadlier virus spreads and decimates U.S. carrier crews and air bases in the Pacific. Would the U.S. slow operations to limit infection at the risk of losing a war? Or would it try to fight through the disease? And would policymakers be forced to choose between supporting civil authorities at home or the external fight? This hypothetical scenario shows that the Pentagon could consider doing more to prepare for the next pandemic, say Rand experts. Fortunately, the steps necessary to minimize the effect of future pandemics on military operations are, for the most part, not costly. They could include incorporating pandemics into scenarios, procuring additional personal protective equipment, increasing the department's medical corps, increasing biosurveillance capabilities, improving information sharing with civil partners, and dispersing forces geographically. None of these options would entail large levels of investment or significant changes in current practices. However, there is one exception to these relatively low cost propositions. Placing a greater emphasis on developing unmanned platforms. There may not be much of an appetite at the Pentagon for devoting additional resources to new initiatives like pandemic preparedness, the researchers say. But war and disease have a, quote, long and wretched history, one that no one wants to see repeated. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making. Through research and analysis. For more on what we covered in this episode, check the show notes at rand.org/podcast. We'll see you next week.